their own, the Celtic language took over from whatever was there previously. Uh, but we don't imagine that there was a huge amount of fighting and so on. The Celts were looking for land, basically, and they came here uh, to farm. And uh, we don't know what kind of homesteads they had, except that they left some remains like this on the landscape. Um, it only had to be, you only had to cut a trench just around here. You didn't have to defend it on the other side. And the same goes for the promise reports uh, at Duke Cannon and uh, Dundonny, now Bag and Bone. It's, it's possible that this was later reused by the Normans. Uh, it's fairly fresh for something that uh, might have been built uh, in the Iron Age, <coughs> say maybe 200 BC or something like that. Uh, the, the, the ditch there is still very well defined uh, and it's possible that the Normans used it uh, as, as in moss. Now, we're not going to talk about moss today, but uh, just to say that when the Normans came in, before they had time to build stone castles, uh, they took advantage of places like this, uh, of sand hills, of old rafts, and any kind of a secure area, and uh, put up their, their timber structures on the top. So it may uh, be originally a promontory fort, later converted to a Norman moss. Uh, I don't have any more to say, really, uh, except you can imagine the landscape at the time would have been not all that unlike the landscape as it is here. Thanks to the Wexford County Council, or whoever, I did a lot of planting here. When the, uh, when the Celts arrived, the country would have been, I'd say, 80% would have been at that time. They came, of course, with their iron uh, and were able to cut down the trees fairly easily. So you can imagine that the area would have been not all that unlike uh, what it is. Like. So if you if you like to walk up there and just stroll around and, and have a look and just see how how defensible this site actually is, um, and then we'll assemble that here. back down. This is a bit that goes around. Could have been what Ned said it was, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I'll take his word for it. Yeah. I'll take his word. Yeah. <laughs> 
There is a line of hills, Tommy you'll be interested in this, you probably know it anyway. There is a, a line of, of hills uh, which were originally underwater volcanoes and these rocks were originally uh, part of the volcanic action underneath the sea sometime perhaps uh, 450 million years ago. It's just an, an interesting little aside. <coughs> Now, the first people to come into Ireland arrived about 9,000 years ago. And they were hunters and, and uh, fishermen, poachers and what have you. And they lived like that for 3,000 years. And then, about 6,000 years ago, the first farming people arrived. And farming originated uh, in the Middle East, came quickly across Europe, and eventually uh, came to Ireland. I should say that Ireland was the last uh, part of Europe to be inhabited. Because in Britain and in the further east of course, they were inhabited 6,000 of years before Ireland. So we, as far as we know, we were the last. Uh, unless people lived here uh, during uh, an interglacial period 30,000 years ago. But if they did, all traces uh, have been wiped away, either by the ice or by rising sea levels around the coast. So we have no trace of anybody before 9,000 years. Farming came in 6,000 years ago, and these farmers, they had uh, various uh, methods of burial. Different groups apparently came in. Some came uh, into the, the west coast, and some came across from Scotland. Some may have come across uh, from Wales <coughs> also. And so there are different uh, kinds of burials associated with uh, different groups that came in. This particular type uh, is called a portal tomb. Now, up to, up to recently, it was known as a dolmen. And a dolmen is Breton for stone table. But the archaeologists don't like the term, and so they use the term now, a portal tomb. Uh, these are portal stones. These are the, the entrance uh, to the tomb. This was, sorry, this, this was a tomb, of course. You always had a hierarchical societies, and the, the Stone Age in Ireland uh, wouldn't have been any different. So uh, tombs like this were obviously for important people. Ordinary Joe Soap wouldn't, be, wouldn't get such a, a mausoleum as this. And uh, there are about 150 of those in Ireland. They generally face east, like this one, and upslope. There's usually a stream close by, but there's no stream all that close uh, to this one. But generally they're, they're also uh, close to a stream. They're dated uh, around the same period as Newgrange, uh, which would be 2500 BC. Um, farming was well established at that period, of course. Um, the finds in them have been fairly scarce. Uh, you get small pieces of pottery, particular type of fairly coarse pottery. You get some uh, little, little arrowheads and uh, some bones. It seems uh, that there was, they didn't have cremation. They had pre cremation of previous periods, but they didn't have it at this particular time. And you, what you find uh, would be just maybe a scatter of bones, unburnt bones. Um, it seems that um, before a body or bodies were put into uh, a portal tomb, that they were left either they were left out somewhere to decay of their own accord, scavenged and so on and then the, the skeleton would, would, was put in. That's, the, uh, that's what the archaeologists uh, tell us. Uh, you can see the, the, uh, the construction, these two portal stones, uh, and the, the huge capstone resting on a back stone. So the whole thing is resting on just three stones, two in the front, one at the back, and then they built up the sides here with, with just side stones, and 
usually they, they also put a stone in front. That can vary in size. Sometimes it's quite large. There's, a, there's one in Harrelstown in, in County Carlow, if any of you know, which mm -hmm. really blocks up the front of it completely. But uh, this one is, is only quite small. There's only one other one in Wexford, uh, and that's in Newborn. Uh, but it, it has collapsed. The county council talk about uh, raising up the capstone. <coughs> um, but I was telling the county manager recently that we, we already have one with a capstone on it. He wasn't aware of this one. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so perhaps in time the council will take over this and uh, provide access to it and clean up all around it. I think it would be well worthwhile mm -hmm. since it's the only uh, decent one that we have in the county. Um, <coughs> but yes, it, it, along with, with what you see here, there would have been a, what they call a cairn of stones going back maybe 15 yards down the hill, and that would have come up uh, to about that height uh, on the uh, on the portal stones. And it it seems that they they were able to lever, they could lever it up. They'd have uh, they'd have huge uh, big branches and pieces of trees and of course they had lots of they had plenty of people probably plenty of slaves mm -hmm. uh, you can imagine the chairman of the old extra society with his, <laughs> his slaves and he's getting them. so it would have been levered up that's the that's the general opinion now i said uh, that they were dated to 2500 bc and that was uh, generally accepted up to fairly recently but uh dr ann lynch from the office of public works uh, recently excavated Powell-Nabrone portal tomb in County Clare and in fact she found uh, that it was dated to a much earlier period, maybe even 4000 BC. So uh, archaeology changes uh, all the time with, with the new, new discoveries. So it, it's possible that they were built over quite a longer period than we had imagined. They were generally attributed to 2500 BC around that period. Uh, the end of the uh, of what we call the Neolithic, or the end of the Stone Age, which finished at about 2000 BC. I don't want to confuse you with dates, uh, but the Stone Age in Ireland finished 2000 BC. And then you came into the Bronze Age, which lasted until 500 BC, and then you had the Iron Age, which we talked about at the, the previous site, and uh, we're still in that. We're still in that age. Or uh, maybe we're in the plastic age now. I'm not sure what we what we call it. Um, It'd be covered with earth then, wouldn't it? Sorry? That would all be covered with earth, wouldn't it? That's not uh, that's not certain now. Uh no cover from the body. No. That's not easily covered in the earth. But they they may have covered the body some way uh, inside. Mm. There are very few finds uh, in these. Mm. Uh, they haven't found a lot of artefact in them mm -hmm. and um, it's an open question archaeologists mm -hmm. differ on mm -hmm. um, I was wondering whether it would have been area shelters for the, for the UFO <laughs> 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 well, that's a, try that out on an archaeologist and see what that's you well it's hard it's hard to believe that it would I, w I would have thought that the pair of stones uh, might have been brought up yes, yes. Uh, rather than mineral. rather than clay. Mm -hmm. uh, and stones and then like grass and earth. But uh, <laughs> when 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 I was working on the on the Heritage Park, and I had an advisor, Gabriel Cooney, Dr. Gabriel Cooney from UCD, mm -hmm. uh, he designed the portal tomb in the park, and he was absolutely adamant uh, that the cairn of stones only came up to here. Mm -hmm. But he's only going on uh, what he's finding now. Most of the most of the stones have been removed. Of course, stones were always removed from the yes, Somebody used them. Always. Mm. So there are only about ten uh, portal tombs in Ireland now uh, that have any trace of a cairn. So you know, it's fairly speculative. Mm. There is a in, in the folklore. There is a, a, an interesting theory that. Um, for couples who are having uh, any difficulty in, in having children, that uh, if they sleep 
on top of the catwalk <laughs> overnight that uh, the woman will conceive. This goes back to it goes back to the story of Dermot and Grania, of course, because these are often called uh, Dermot and Grania's beds. Yeah. Uh, so it goes back to some Okay. Wants to elaborate. <laughs> Anyone care to try and sleep there? Your next to Any any? No inscriptions ever found in No, no, nothing, nothing on those. Um, well, there would be no inscriptions of any kind on the... Maybe on the inside of the... No. No, no. no there was no right. No, but not. No, they didn't. So it was that you, you can really move it with your hand. Mm. There's a famous one, of course, in uh, Browns Hill in Carlow. Mm. And uh, the capstone in that is reckoned mm. to weigh a uh, hundred tons. Yeah. It's absolutely immense. Mm. And Nelly, Nelly mm. Walsh was just reminding me earlier there of a one day that we went there with uh, Dr. Haddon and he must have been over 80 at the time but I remember uh, myself and maybe it was yourself Nelly, I can't remember but it's a very steep hill that you have to climb to a ground hill and uh, Dr. Haddon uh, was there and I had one arm and somebody else had the other arm and we actually hauled him up uh, to, the, to the top of Brown's Hill and he was over 80. Yeah. He, was very, he was a very determined man, yes. He, he, us, he never had an overcoat. Uh, I never, I never, I never saw socks on the window. Yeah, I often sat in in his house at night and he'd be talking, and his legs would be completely blue, completely blue, and he'd be oblivious. He'd be just talking about Wexford town, and some aspect of Wexford and archaeology. And they came in with the. Probably with Christianity. Oh yes, right, writing came with Christianity. Yeah. The only thing that we may have had before that was the Om. Oh, that would have been before. Yes, but I mean, Om is not really writing. Om is simply uh, just inscriptions on stones saying uh, of Om, grandson of Machu, or something like that. Just commemorating uh, somebody, or even boundary markers. On the edges of the stone. Yes. Yeah. If you take if you take that to be an ohm stone, a, a better shape, the the incised lines and uh, the num depending on the number of lines and the angle that they were at, give you a letter. For example, if you had if you had a, do it this way, if you had three lines cut in there going that way, that if I remember rightly was a C, and then you'd have a line maybe going that way. That would be V. Now, I can't remember all the letters, mm -hmm. but that's how they did it. And then you read it starting here and coming around that way. And the one in the uh, actually the one in the National Heritage Park was uh, the inscription was done for me by Punchy Isni Kahan, Professor Punchy Isni Kahan, who is coming to you in October, Seamus, isn't it? to give you a lecture. She's uh, she has Wexford connections. Her father taught in Shilbagan, I think. She's a professor of early Irish in UCD. And uh, she thought up the inscription, and she uh, the inscription in the Heritage Park is of own grandson of Mach Troon. Now Mach Troon, Rosvik Troon. Do you think of Rosvik yeah. Troon? Mm -hmm. so that's how she got in the connection, which yeah. I thought was rather nice. There's a key to the form in the Book of Leinster. It's fairly controversial. Uh, Samuel Ferguson, the poet, he, he did a lot of work on. Uh, mm. On the own. Could all be considered actual writing? It's a series of lines. That's all. It's a series of lines. And the two are dead. Here and there. Well, I have to tell you that the three balls never existed. It's all mythology. It's all mythology. There's a great danger of mixing up mythology and and. Uh, and actual archaeology. Yeah, so, yeah. They don't fit together all that. And I have to tell you, the bus is going in three minutes. <laughs> well, I'm not downgrading mythology. It's very important and very interesting, but it's a different field. 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 It's a different 
Well, oh, gosh, lunch. <laughs> lunch. <laughs> <laughs> no calories. <laughs> no calories. There's no such word as raft really, it's a raft, or a tea cutter in the in the Irish. Uh, but we still call them raft. This is uh Rathanishka and we don't know why why it's associated with water. Uh, there's, there's nothing in the in the tradition of the area which uh, gives us a clue uh, to the name. I, I, I talked about the, 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 the Belge coming in, the Celtic tribes coming in, uh, about 500 BC. And for over a thousand years, Ireland was not subject to invasion until, the, until the, uh, eventually the Vikings came and of course their first attack in Wexford was 819 AD. Um, so there was over a thousand years in which the, the Celtic society was able to develop uh, free from outside interference. And that's why Ireland uh, has, uh, is, is the real home uh, now of information on, on the Celts. Because we, we have the, the laws, the Breton laws, the annals and all those going back and giving us a lot of information on the Celtic way of life. And it's to Ireland mainly now that scholars come to learn uh, from us and from our, from our literature. And there I mention even also from the mythology uh, because there is often a grain of truth, of course, in the mythology as well. Uh, what, was, uh, what was Wexford like, uh, say, about the year 800 AD? Because that's roughly the time that I, I want to put the talk at, say, 800 AD. As I say, a very settled society, uh, a very uh, aristocratic society, hierarchical society. And where County Wexford is now, um, it was divided up into tuhas, and the, the different tuha were ruled by different uh, clans and different uh, families. For example, uh, in the south you had what we call the Barony of Fort. That was ruled uh, by a family called Larkin, or Ullurkon. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it was called... The, East Boharta area. Bargi uh, was belonged to the Ibaraki. Now the Ibaraki had been a very powerful tribe in Leinster until the Ikinsla coming in uh, from Ossery drove a wedge between uh, the Ibaraki uh, who are now in Sleeve Margi up in, in Leash and the, the Ibaraki uh, of South Wexford. The people of uh, of Fort, the Larkons, were the mercenaries of the Ibaraki. This area here, as far as I could make out, uh, belonged to the, what we now call the Shelmelir. This is the barony of Shelmelir. Uh, this was the Shield Melir, the seed of Melir. Melir was actually one of the Ekinsulas. The Ekinsulas had come in in the 5th century and they were gradually uh, taking over more territory. And, uh, to the, uh, to the up around Balakin, there was another family of the Ekinsulas called the Ephelma. So uh, we know quite a bit about uh, the, the setup, uh, the political setup in the County of Wexford area at the time. Eventually, of course, the, uh, then there was Shelburne, the Shield Brian, and there was Bantry. They were different non Ekinsula tribes. Eventually, the Ekinsulas uh, became rulers of all South Leinster. Uh, and then uh, later again they became rulers of Leinster. Dermot MacMillan, Wayne the Mole, and eventually of course uh, Dermot MacMorra himself. So this here is, as I say, is a raft. I have to use the word raft because I've got to use it. I can't say raft. Uh, this was the home of either a nobleman 
or a strong farmer. There were five grades of nobles and there were five grades of farmers uh, around, around 800 AD in what we call the early Christian period. The rafts began to be built uh, around 500 AD and there were the chief dwelling places in Ireland between 500 and 1000 AD. It's fairly easy to remember the dates. Now you may read in, in some older books that the rafts are, uh, are earlier, much earlier, and that they're also much later. But the most recent archaeological evidence uh, points very strongly to the fact that they were used in that period, 500 to 1000 AD. As I say, they were the dwelling places of, of, the, of nobles and strong farmers. Society at the time was divided into uh, nobles and commoners. The restaurant we're talking about. Uh, but they actually had uh, the nobles. The farmers were free men. They owned their land. Uh, they often got cattle from the chieftain of the, of the area, uh, rented cattle from him and paid them back uh, uh, in kind. Um, you had cottiers then who would be bound uh, to the lord or to the farmer. And of course you had plenty of slaves. We had lots of slaves in Ireland. Uh, there were uh, numerous uh, accounts of uh, the Irish chieftains uh, buying, uh, taking Viking slaves. And the slaves of course were made to do all the hard work. They would have to do the, the ploughing and, and the harrowing and the women would have to grind the corn with the quern stones, which was extremely uh, hard work. Um, there was a big trade between uh, Bristol and Wexford, apparently, in, uh, in slaves. So, and slavery, of course, uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't frowned on by the church either. In a uh, lot of the lives of the saints, there are references to uh, slaves. And, uh, in fact, it was rather ignominious for a free man to be even talking to a slave, or for a, a, a churchman uh, to be talking to a slave. They were certainly very much uh, looked down on. Now, what, uh, if we take this as the homestead of a rich farmer, which it very likely was, we can see that uh, there was a, a ditch on the outside. That's why I put you up there. If you look behind you, you'll see a, a very deep ditch and then you have a bank here, and then you have another smaller ditch inside here. Now, around that bank, there would have been a, a palisade of timbers. There would have been posts driven down, uh, maybe six feet apart, and then other posts in between. Sometimes uh, they used a white horn hedge uh, instead of a palisade. But it would have been uh, certainly reasonably well defended. This is possibly the original uh, entrance uh, to this grass as it would have been 800 years ago. So, what was inside here then? Well, we have fairly good records uh, of, of, uh, of the setup. There would have been, it would have been packed with houses. Um, the houses would have been probably of timber, maybe of wattle. Some of them might have been of clay, and there might have been one perhaps of stone at very most. There would have been lean tools all over the place uh, for machinery, uh, no sides though, I should say. They never had a side. There is no word in the Irish language for hay. In fact, they never cut hay, as far as we know. Uh, because there is no word in the language for either a side or for hay. Michael might be, be interested in that fact. Maybe <laughs> that was when, hay, when hay came in. Um, so this would, have been a, this would have been a hive of, of uh, activity. Uh, there would have been geese and, and uh, hens. They didn't keep bring the cattle in here. That's, that's uh, no longer believed. At one time it was said that they brought the cattle in here, but they didn't because uh, cattle were very important at the time. Uh, and a person's value in society was measured by the number of cattle that he had. His honor price was determined by the number of cattle he had. And uh, the principal sport at the time was for young men was actually cattle raiding. It was, it was a sport. So the thinking now is that there is no way the cattle would have been brought in here because you would have been simply collecting them uh, for, the, for the thieves to come and take them away. So, as I say, a hive of activity, the houses, in the houses you would have had the hearth in the centre of the house, you would have a roof, 
uh, you would have had the, the women uh, spinning and weaving, they would have been grinding the corn, and uh, there would be all kinds of, of implements uh, within the house. Um, originally, within those, say in the 5th, 6th century, you would have had what they called the Derefina. You would have had the grandfather, grandmother, father and mother, and the children uh, in the one compound, we call it. But by the reckoned by about 800 AD, that idea was gone, and you were down to the, the nuclear family uh, at, at a place like this. Around, around on the outside of the raft, then, you would have had the Arab land. You would have had small fields of about an acre, where you would have, uh, they would have grown uh, corn, and the crops that they had, the principal crop was oats. Next was barley, and then wheat, and then rye. And uh, I, I won't go into too much detail on the ploughs because, in fact, we don't know very much anyway. There isn't much evidence of the type of ploughs that they had. But beyond the cultivated area then, there would have been forests. We would still have been maybe 50-60% forest in Ireland. So beyond the cultivated area around here, you had forest and moorland and, and upland. And the cattle would have been grazing out there and the young boys would have been mining the cattle. And, uh, you had also transhumans at the time. Uh, I, I'm put in mind of that because we have uh, we have uh, a lady here with us today from a place called Old Bully, mm -hmm. and bullying, as it was called in Irish, was the system whereby during the summer the cows were taken up to to high ground and kept up there for the summer and brought back down to the lower ground uh, for the winter. That was known as bullying. And there, in, in, the, in the townland names, you still find that of, of uh, Bully. And there's one out, out uh, near Tom Poo. The uh, They reckon that the size of the farm uh, is closely related to our modern townland. In other words, there was possibly a raft uh, in every town, in every townland in Ireland. Uh, it was thought up to maybe 30 years ago that there were about 40,000 uh, rats in the country between 500 and 1,000 AD. The uh, recent uh, Office of Public Works studies uh, using aerial photographs and so on indicates that the numbers were much greater, perhaps 60, perhaps even 70,000. Um, they may not have been used continuously over that period, or some would have become derelict and so on, and others would have been brought into use. But they reckon there are traces of 60 to 70,000 uh, rats uh, in, uh, in Ireland. What the population been at the The population uh, was reckoned, it's very difficult to know, but uh, they reckon about a half a million. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it fluctuated because you had, uh, one year you might have a famine, because of course th there wasn't any great way of storing uh, the, uh, the the materials, the, the, the meat and so on. Uh, so in a bad year you, you would have famine. And uh, plague of course was almost endemic, so the you know, population would, would fluctuate uh, quite a lot. The type of animals that they had, uh, they had uh, cattle of course, but mainly cows. They killed off uh, the, young, the young bulls and uh, the old cattle and used those for meat. But because they, they live principally on uh, what they call bon bee or, or white food, that's meat, meat foods. Yeah. So it was mainly uh, cows. And as I say, a person's worth was measured in the number of cows uh, that he had. They had sheep as well. And the sheep were used uh, mainly for wool, for spinning and weaving. There are not so many mentions in the record of uh, mutton uh, being eaten. There are a few, but not many. Pork was the principal meat, uh, pork and uh, bacon, of course they smoked the bacon and they would have, they would have uh, stitches of bacon hanging up in, uh, inside their houses, just as uh, they did have in farmers' houses up to uh, a few years ago, maybe some places even still. Um, the, uh, the crops that they had, Well, the, sorry, the food that they had then, as I say, were bone bee or white food, 
and they had, I think, about five different kinds of cheese. They had as many kinds of cheese as we have now. They had hard cheese, they had cottage cheese, and various kinds of cheese. Uh, the bread was made principally from barley. Bread made from wheat was a delicacy, uh, which would be uh, eaten by uh, the nobleman, or perhaps by, by visitors, or by the abbot, abbot of a monastery. Uh, but the, the ordinary people would not have had uh, wheat bread so much. They would have had porridge, quite a lot of Quaker oats uh, would have been taken. And uh, root, root also was, was uh, eaten uh, quite a lot. Mainly foods made from the, the, the cereal and uh, milk. Now around, around the, the, the country then, to get a, a view of the country, you would have had monasteries of course. The Irish took to monasteries, monastic like, like fish to water. So the country was uh, full of monasteries, and in, in Wexford uh, at that time, you would have, well, on the borders, you would have had St. Mullins up near Great Lamanna. You would have had Ferns, you would have had uh, Tumon, there was uh, a small one in, in Camrys, uh, there was one in Adamstown. So the, mon the mon monasteries uh, were very powerful at the time. In fact, it's reckoned that they owned one third of the land of Ireland uh, around that time. But the church was, uh, was certainly very powerful. Uh, on, on many of the streams, they would have had mills, uh, particularly the horizontal mill. Uh, I'm not going to try to describe that. You've, you've probably seen it in the Heritage Park anyway. And a farmer would probably have had a share uh, in a mill. He wouldn't have uh, possibly owned a mill of his own. The monasteries that did own the mills, and they charged, uh, they charged the uh, farmers for, for milling as well. The, the monasteries, the, the farmers had to share. I have a, I have a document, and this is, a, I, I finished them. Just to, uh, there is an account of uh, what a farmer would say of 800 AD, what he should have had in his possession. And I, I just read it out. A cauldron with its spit and handy, <laughs> a vat in which a measure of ale may be brewed, a cauldron for everyday use, Small vessels, iron pots, and kneading trough, and wooden mugs. They didn't have much pottery at that time, uh, so that there is no need to borrow them. A washing trough, and a bath, tubs, candlesticks, knives for cutting rushes, ropes, an adze, an auger, a pair of wooden shears, an axe, the work tools for every season, every one unborrowed. We're supposed to borrow. A whetstone, a billhook, a hatchet, shear, uh, spears for slaughtering animals, a fire always alive, this was important, a candle on the candlestick without stain, a full flowy outfit with all its equipment. That seems to go against some other accounts of, uh, of the plough, that ploughing was actually shared. Of course, ploughing wasn't done by horses, ploughing was done with oxen. And there were two types of ploughs. There was a light plough, which was pulled by two oxen, and there was a heavier type cow which could be pulled by four and sometimes even six up. Um, he is a man of three snouts. The snout of a, of a rooting boar. The snout of a flitch of bacon on the hoof. The snout of a plough under the ground. So that he is capable of receiving a king or a bishop or a scholar or a brehem from the road. Prepared for the arrival of any guest company. He owns seven houses. A kiln, a barn, a mill, a house of 27 feet, an outhouse of 17 feet, a pigsty, a pen for cows, a sheep pen. He has 20 cows, two bulls, six oxen, 20 pigs, 20 sheep, four domestic boars, two sows, a saddle horse, an enamel bridle, 16 bushels of seed in the ground. He has a bronze cauldron in which there is room for a boar. He possesses a green in which there are always sheep without having to change pasture. And lastly, he and his wife have four suits of clothes. <laughs> so you can see that he was quite, quite wealthy. These were wealthy, uh, wealthy uh, people. That's all I have to say about, the, uh, about that early Christian farming and, and the raft. There are many of those in Wexford. Some of them actually have two banks. I don't know of anyone with three banks. Uh, and it's hoped that the, in time that the county council will acquire some of those which are close to the road 
and, and uh, preserve them for, for future generations. Uh, the county manager is very anxious to do that, in fact, so hopefully it will happen within the next few years. I, I want to come on to a later period. The, the Cromwellian plantation here saw um, all this area being handed over to families uh, like Holmes and Poole and others who later became Quakers and very peace-loving people, as, as we know. And this place actually was turned into a Quaker burial ground. And over there, uh, over there, if you, if you want to walk through there, you can actually see Quaker headstones. Uh, they're still there. And of course, Holmes, uh, Holmes town is quite near here. And one of the homes was the cartographer of uh, Penn, who founded Pennsylvania. That's all I have to say, if there's any questions. Mm -hmm. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, before you break up, on behalf of society, I'd like to thank Ned for his talk. I know the younger working people. <coughs> on behalf of you all, I will ask for all the same support. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a very well-known saying, Si monumentum requiris circumstance. If a monument you seek, look around you. Well, I think you have only to look at the Heritage Park in Wexford to find a fitting monument to our very learned speaker today. It is, it is a proof of his great erudition, of his learning, and above all of his research. He has unstintingly given us, given us a lecture here today on a wonderful story of the earlier life in Wexford. And he has left us in his desk. What a pity we could not have it in print to peruse and to study because he has given us the most powerful, a very great amount in a small space of time. And for his learning and for his unstinted and unselfish work in the Wexford Society down through the years, I, sh I would say he deserves our very best thanks. Good Amila Mahagas, as a sort of Thank you, Thank you, Oh, there's a great. Oh, good Lord, yes. Yeah. Well, there's something written on it, isn't there? Yes, there is. Yes. Fairfield, 1906. 1906. Davis, oh, they, they must be all Davis all down there. I wonder are they? Oh no, this Davis. isn't Davis. Well, oh, this is Davis again. The whole room must be Davis. <laughs> You probably find this in the library. You know, um, oh, you uh, know that man from which I did all the stuff. Oh yeah, they came to the beginning of the year. They were whole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you read it? No. 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 That's Davies as well. See that? Can you read that? Oh, yes, that's right, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
1940. 1940. Oh, Christ, I thought they were more ancient than that. Those must be the... Hmm? They must be the less... Um, sorry, sorry, yes, can that's you get through there? No, that's okay. That's it, okay. It, it, probably you're I being a light... I, you get I, I heard you... In 1940, yes. Well, get me before they get I won't get it. Right, yes, I don't you want are. this to get in the way of your light. You no, no, that's a... You'd have to angle it back. Yeah, yeah you'd want to. Yeah, you'd want to. Oh, 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 o